Yeah, good evening, everyone. Good to see you at church tonight. Let's take our hymnals, and if you're able to stand, we invite you to stand and turn to 249. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. 249, let's stand up and sing out of the Lord tonight. Yeah. 
pray, Lord, that, uh, that you'll bless this evening. This may be the very last church service we ever get to have. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Lord, we, we want it to be honoring and glorifying to you. And, uh, really, we realize every time we meet, it may be the last time. And, uh, Lord, we want you, again, to, be, to, to receive all the praise and honor and glory. Lord, Lord, we pray for our nation tonight. Yes, Lord. And, uh, boy, are we in need of you, Lord. Lord. Uh, we're in need of you individually. We're in need of you uh, as our churches are just a mess. Yes, Lord. Lord, which is why our nation's a mess. But, mm -hmm. uh, Lord, you said if a nation would repent, if it would turn, uh, you would hear for You would hear. And you would heal them. You would help them. Yes. And, Lord, we need you. Thanks. And uh, we just pray that your will gets accomplished. Lord, bless this offering. Thank you again. Uh, for the opportunity and the privilege to be able to give. And we just uh, thank you and ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Changing the context. 
Uh, and so uh, this verse, we're all familiar with, uh, with it, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. By the way, you'll notice in most versions, of it's like you, there's certain verses you can look at and know that you've got a wrong version of the Bible. If your Bible says, who strengtheneth you tonight, you've got a wrong Bible tonight. Uh, that's one of the verses you can look at because they always say, who strengtheneth you? And, and uh, we're going to split here so much about it tonight, but I will mention why it says why. I believe it says which uh, versus who. Okay, and I think it matters uh, really a lot to deal with how successful you'll be as a Christian, that one word and, and, and how, it, how it applies. So we'll look at that tonight. But I want to look at uh, in verse number 10, Philippians 4.10, it says, um, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. What Paul's talking about, if you're not familiar with the passage, he's commending, uh, or he's, he's counseling and teaching uh, the Christians at Philippi how he had learned to just trust God for his financial supply. And that's really what it was about. He was talking about, hey, yeah, I've learned if I've got a lot, if God's given me a lot, guess what? I know how to handle it. You know, a lot of a lot uh, can really mess somebody up sometimes. Yeah. And abundance can, can cause somebody to get very complacent. He says, I know how to deal with it if it's a lot. And he, he goes, I know how to deal with it if i got nothing, if I'm poor. Because I've learned, and he says, I've learned that no matter what state I'm in, if I'm in a state of, Man, the blessings financially are just pouring out to me. Or, man, I haven't seen anything in a long time. He says, I've learned whatever state I'm in, I'm just going to be content. I heard one preacher say over the years that uh, if you look at the Ten Commandments, the biggest problem that we have with the Ten Commandments is they all deal with the same issue, and that's covetousness. Because that's really the opposite of contentment is is covetousness, not being satisfied uh, with what God has provided for us. And so he's saying here, I, I've learned. I've learned how to do it. And he says, but it's not me who did it, but I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So once again, he gives the glory to God through the Lord Jesus Christ to say, it's not me doing it, it's, it's the Lord who's taught me this. It's the Lord who shows me, and it's the Lord who has strengthened me with the ability to do that. Because as we all know, that's not always the easiest thing to do. Uh, sometimes our greatest times of complaining and murmuring are not necessarily in those times of abounding, but in those times of abasing, in those times of, of lack. And, uh, and so it's not always e easy to do that. So I want to look at this verse tonight in a way that the title is, What I Can Do Through Christ Next Year. Now, we're probably already doing some of this, but it's, you know, it's a good time. Uh, New Year's. Is always a good time, uh, as I mentioned Sunday, of kind of a, 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 a kind of a reflection time. Okay, well, how have I grown this year? You know, I hope you can step back and say, you know, God has really grown me in this area this year. Praise God for it. Now, if we can't look back and see that God has changed anything or grown anywhere in our life, boy, we ought to take note of that. And say, you know, I, I I didn't finish where I wanted to finish this year. And, uh, and so maybe I need to recommit. Maybe I need to rededicate. Maybe I re recovet it with God uh, back to that place. But it's a time of reflection. It's a time of, of a recommittal. Recommitting and renewing, right? That's what New Year's uh, is all about. And so I thought I'd just challenge you a little bit tonight out of this scripture of uh, what, I, uh, what I can do through Christ next year. And I think it will benefit uh, us individually. It will benefit our families. benefit this church certainly would benefit this country, uh, and, and I think God wants us to do that. So we're going to look at this tonight in two areas. Number one, we're going to look at the education of this verse. It's interesting. He says, I've learned, and he says, and, uh, and, and I'm instructed. You know, this is a verse that teaches us something. 
And this is why it's good to meditate on the Bible. It's good to memorize scripture. Uh, those of you who take up that mantle of challenge to memorize scripture, you know this to be true. That when you're memorizing scripture, you can't help but think of it throughout the day. You can't help it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit uses it to minister to you. Yes. And, uh, and as you study it, as you meditate upon it, it becomes richer. It becomes a little deeper. You, you grab a little bit more understanding. Uh, context becomes a little bit clearer rather than just plucking a verse out and say, I'm going to claim that. Uh, you understand the context. Oh, now I know why Paul said it. And you start, and wow, how does that happen? It happens through meditation. It happens through contemplation, thinking about the scriptures. And so you take a verse like this, I can do all things through Christ with which strengthens me. I, we had a preacher, uh, Mike Drust was here probably about 10 years ago. And I don't forget, he preached on that. Uh, uh, the 10-step program. You know, AA is the 12-step program. He said, here's the 10-step program that uh, that will help you out. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. 10 words. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of truth in that. Because through Christ, I can do all things. I mean, that's a hard one to, to refute. But when you find yourself, I can't. <laughs> See, there's this verse in there that will stick at you and jab at you. Wait a minute, I can do all things through Christ. Well, you just, you're different. I can't do, oh, well, well, well. I can do all things through Christ with strength in me. It's a very convicting verse when, when we get it inside of us. So what does this verse teach? Well, if we break it down a little bit, first of all, I, I, we, we learn this. I can through Christ. This teaches personal decision. It's a personal decision. If you want to, Christ gives you the ability to do it. If you want it, you'll go do it. I remember preaching uh, years ago, a few years ago, a message entitled, The Difference Between I Cannot and I Will Not. Yeah. And uh, the difference is whether you fall into sin or not. The difference is whether you accomplish anything for God. Because if you say, I can't not, you're actually blaming God for why you can't do what you want to do. But if you say, I will not, you're saying, I agree with God, and I'm joining up with God, and I'm engaging my will with His will, and I'm saying, I will not. I'm making this decision, not leaving it to God. And so this verse has the same uh, idea. It's a personal decision. I can. You have to determine, I can. You have to stop saying, I can't do that. Oh, that's too tough. I can't do that. I can't understand it. I can't do this. I can't go out. I can't. No, you can do it. It's a personal decision. So we learn, I can through Christ. You can do it. Uh, number two is, uh, or letter B is, you do through Christ. We learn that you can do through Christ. This speaks of personal ability. What's great is what we have witnessed this year, with all the uncertainty and all the things that are going on, we have realized and been reminded that God has equipped us with the ability to deal with what's going on around us. What a blessing, because if God didn't equip us, he would never ask us to go through this. Because he only asks us to go through things that he equips us with the ability to go through. Hey, hey disciples, uh, let us go on to the other side. He equipped them with the ability to go. They lost sight of it in the middle of that. How did they lose sight of it? Because they, their faith, right? They chose to have fear rather than faith. And in the middle, they, they had to go wake up Jesus, who was fast asleep in the middle of a storm, which I remember saying a few, few months ago, boy, wouldn't it be great to get to that point? Wouldn't that be great to be like the Lord in that case, where you're fast asleep and the storms are howling and raging and the waves are battering and you're just fast asleep. That's where God wants to get us to. Because he already told him, you're going to the other side. He didn't say, let's launch out and hope we get there. He said, let us go into the other side. They, he, they were going, but they, they lost sight of that in, in between there. But they had the ability. He gave them the, the boat. He gave them the ability to get there. He gave them his word. And they had everything they needed to go and do it. And so the same thing, this verse teaches us, I can't do. You can do it. You can do it. You can read that Bible. Amen. Amen. You can read that in a year if you wanted to. And again, there's no word in the Bible that says you have to read your Bible in a year. Mm -hmm. but, but don't tell yourself you can't do it. Because you can do it. Mm. Uh, we were talking with the men last night. We were joking around about time. We all have the same amount of time. Why well, I, I do this? I, no, but we all have 24 hours in a day. Every one of us. And we lose. We, nothing carries over to the next day. 
right? In 24 hours, boom, you're done. Starts a whole new 24 hours. Nothing carries over to the next day. So that's why the Lord says, teach us to number our days, right? We better use, uh, walk circumspectly. How do we use those 24 hours? Um, we, we, we can adjust our schedules. We can adjust those things. All I'm saying is you can do it. God would never tell you uh, daily in the Word, right? We're supposed to read the Word of God daily. You can do it every day. You can do it. Well, you don't know. You can do it every day. That's what the verse teaches us. I can do it. He's given us the ability. Now, here's the other thing. I can do what? All things. Boy, that word all is pretty tricky, isn't it? What well, I just get you. Well, what about this? Yeah, but that, well, that, that, that word all includes everything. Uh, I heard uh, preacher Dave Young said this years ago at a revival. He said the only good thing that's ever come out of the Supreme Court of the United States is they define the word all. And the word all, uh, as defined by the United States Supreme Court, is uh, it includes everyone and excludes no one. So if we interpret that the same way here, I can do all things. It includes all things, right? It includes everything and excludes nothing. So that means the, the physical things that you and I have to endure, guess what? You can do it. You can get through it. You can, you, you can handle it. You, you, through the Lord, you can do it. Uh, 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 teach it about personal practices, all things. Uh, emotionally. Listen, I don't know if you know this or not. We all have emotional struggles. Mm -hmm. We all have emotional issues, some more than others. Amen? Mm -hmm. There's a chance I need to let me out on that one. Right? <laughs> we, we all have that. Why? Because God made us emotional creatures. But the difference is, He's made Himself to be the antidote for our emotional issues. And we turn to all kinds of worldly things for the antidote, for the medicine to deal with our emotional issues when he's the one that's supposed to be the one we're turning to. And so, uh, what I'm saying is, it doesn't matter emotionally what you're going through. Uh, he's, he was tempted at all points like we are, yet without sin. We have not a high priest who was not touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He even uses the term feelings. We can go to the Lord. So it teaches us all things. Of course, spiritual things too. I can do all things. Well, but this, no, all things. Amen. All things. How do we do them? Through Christ. That's your personal trainer. Amen. Personal trainer. Uh, it doesn't say Christ does them for you. Does it? It doesn't say that. See, here's the difference between the word which and the word who. When you use the word who, it implies the focus is on Jesus. Paul did not intend this verse for the focus to be on Jesus. Paul intended this verse for the focus to be on what he could do, he could do, through Jesus. He said, what do you mean, preacher? You're confusing me. Okay. Well, you know how we always talk about positional righteousness, practical righteousness. You know, God did for us, that's positional. But God doesn't do for us what he expects us to do. So what this is saying is, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So the, we, we know our strength comes from the Lord, right? He is the strength. He is my salvation. He is my life. He is my strength, David said, right? But how do you know how, do you know how he has strengthened you? You know, Peter said, let me come out of the boat, Lord. He knew the Lord could strengthen him, but how did he know? He didn't know for sure, or he didn't, he didn't experience that strength until what? Until he stepped out of the boat. He could do all things through Christ which strengthened him. And the Lord strengthened him until he doubted, until he, he feared and realized, what am I doing out here? And the Lord still helped them. And praise God, you know, other than Jesus, Peter's the only other one that walked down water. That's a pretty big accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Amen? So when we get on Peter, let's not get on him too hard because, man, he stepped out of the boat. I don't know if we would have. And uh, But but here's the, the point is, through Christ, he's our personal trainer. Uh, and, and, and it's through Him. We can do those things through Him. But it's up to us to do them through Him. Now, the last part is, which strengthens me and teaches a personal benefit. There's a benefit to this verse. And uh, I, I want to show this to you real quick before we get to the second point. 
And I want you to go to the book of Psalms. Mark your place here because we'll come back. But Psalm 68:19. I found this pretty interesting. Uh, a, a kind of a neat little thread through these three verses I'm going to share with you real quick here. You can write these down if you want. Uh, I didn't put them on there for you. But uh, Psalm 68 and verse number 19 says this. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us, loadeth us with benefits. Even the God of our salvation, Selah. What a great verse. Like every day you get up, God loads you. He loads you with benefits. Daily. Now we don't often recognize those, but He daily loads you. Now let me show you the next one. Go to Psalm 103, verse 2. Keep in mind about this idea about beneficial or benefits. Psalm 103, verse 2. So we have, you know, blessed is He, He daily loadeth us with benefits. We have Psalm 103, verse number 2. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not, what? All His benefits. benefits. So, so daily, God loads us with benefits. And then, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all those benefits. So we, we need to know what they are, and we need to forget not that God has blessed us. That this day we have been loaded with God's blessings. Now here's the convicting one. Now go to Psalm 116. 116. In verse number 12. This is when the Lord goes, you know, this is the knowledge versus the application. Psalm 116, verse number 12 says this. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? So daily, man, bless the Lord, he loads us with benefits. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Man, God's blessed me so much and been beneficial. What am I going to do for him? Yeah. Yeah. Do you see that? See, there's a process in there because when we appreciate and understand what God's done for us, we ought to say, man, we, what, do we, what can we do for the Lord now? He's done so much for us. He's loaded us with benefits this day. So many of us go through the days, we don't even recognize how much God's benefited us. We don't even give glory to God. We're, we're so consumed with what's going on in our life and the struggles and the day-to-day -day things that we don't ever step back and, and step back and say, wow, God has blessed us today. You know, don't ever forget, every morning, God renews His mercy unto us. Amen. Every morning, God renews His mercies unto us. Now, don't ever forget that His grace is sufficient. His grace is eternal. Don't, don't ever forget that salvation by grace through faith is forever. Every day we ought to say, oh Lord, you've done so much, you've been so much. What can I do for you? What am I, and, and it's not so much asking him, it's, it's knowing what we're supposed to do for him. And saying, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Why do I get strengthened? He, daily, he loads me with his benefits, which strengtheneth me. And so, uh, this teaches a personal benefit. So that's what the verse teaches. Wow, that's a pretty deep verse, isn't it? I mean, it, it's a whole lot more than, than uh, uh, you know, it's one of the ones you always see stitched on the pillow in Amish country, right? I can do all things through Christ. Who strengthens me is how you see it, but which strengthens me. It's a very uh, common and popular verse to people because it is a very inspirational verse. But it does teach us how personal this is and how reliant upon it is up to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, but we have to do all things. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense to you. Now, how do we exercise this verse? How do we how do we look at it and say, okay, if this is what our where our heart's going to be for next year and, and going into the new years, well, what what are some things that that how I can apply this verse that uh, is going to be beneficial to me? Well, I wrote down a few things here. Hopefully. Uh, they'll make a little sense to you. But if you go back to Philippians, um, and we'll get some of these other verses in here as well. But letter A under number two is simply this. Through Christ, I can learn contentment. Contentment has to be learned. 
Isn't that what Paul said? I've learned. There with I've learned to be content. You know, when you learn things, um, you know, you, you have to uh, experience things sometimes. And you learn it. And he says, well, I, I better learn. I can't get out of balance here if I have too much. And I can't get out of balance if I don't have enough. I've learned. I've, I've been instructed uh, by God how to, how to handle these things and how to just be content. Uh, Hebrews 13 in uh, verse, well, actually Philippians 4, I'm sorry. Uh, we, we see the uh, verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Uh, Hebrews 13 and verse number 5 says this. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So our contentment is found where? In the Lord Jesus Christ and his provision. And he'll never leave us and he'll never forsake us. Um, if you look at, uh, what's the other one I have here? Oh, 1 Timothy. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. Timothy talks a little bit about, uh, or Paul talks to Timothy a little bit about contentment in regards to ministry and those things. But uh, he says here in verse uh, chapter 6, verse number 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Mm -hmm. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain, it is absolute, it is guaranteed, we can carry nothing out. Yeah. And having food and raiment, clothing, let us therewith, uh, let us be therewith content. Mm -hmm. But they that will be, will be rich. Now, now notice the wording there. The word will is very important. It's not saying people that are rich. God is not condemning people who are rich. What he's saying is those who will be rich, those who desire to be rich, those who are seeking after riches, those who engage their will to go after the riches of this world, he says those people there that will be rich, it's an attitude, they will be rich, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all evil. Which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced them things, uh, themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. So, through Christ, applying this verse, I can learn how to be content. And uh, which is so crucial for us as Christians to know. Secondly, I can live, I, through Christ, I can live courageously. I can live courageously. Um, I want you to go over to Psalm 27, verse 14. and show you this verse, Psalm 27, 14. I love the definition of the word uh, courageous, bravery. The quality of the mind that enables men to encounter danger and difficulties with firmness or without fear or depression of spirits. Valor. Psalm 27, verse 14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Amen. We have to learn how to live courageously. One of the great kings of the Old Testament uh, in Judah was a king named Asa. And the Bible specifically says in, in relation to Asa, it says, and Asa took courage. You know, courage comes from the Lord. Bravery, boldness comes from the Lord in a relationship with the Lord and fellowship with the Lord. And what Asa did was he took what God made available for him and he applied it. And in his case, uh, being the king, he implemented, implemented incredible spiritual reforms. They got rid of the groves and the high places and the false idols. He, he removed the Sodomites out of the land. He did all kinds of things, and he took courage, and took courage to do that. Especially when the whole society was going in a different direction, uh, it took courage to do that. I was talking to Pastor Al Davis today. We recorded our broadcast for Friday, and we were talking about, a lot about uh, these different things. And it's amazing that we were talking about how, how much in the Scripture that the admonition to stay close to the Lord was really uh, an admonition not to go down the road that our country is trying to go down. A lot of the kings, uh, they were, while they were dealing with religious things, a lot of the social things they were dealing with are the same social things you and I are dealing with right now. 
And there's a group of people that want to take this in a totally radical, ungodly, immoral way. And, and, and the Bible overwhelmingly says, don't do it. Consent thou not when, when sinners entice thee. And boy, it is enticing, isn't it? I mean, you can have everything for free. Free this, free that. Daniel was given that opportunity. Hey, you get free education, free housing, free clothing, free food, uh, free wine, free meat, whatever you want. And he said, I will not defile myself with the king's meat. And that's why God blessed Daniel. And so um, it, it's going to take courage. It's going to take courage. I've said, I told our man last night, the one, the one thing that always gets me is, you know, as we take a step out, just living right, you're going to become a threat to people. Jesus was a threat to people. That's why they killed them. That's why they falsely accused them. They killed them. They persecuted them because there was a threat. And boy, the government likes to threaten people. There was a lady up in Oregon. She won't shut her salon down. She needs to eat. Imagine that. They're going to send CPS in and take her children away because she, she won't shut down her salon. I'll be honest. That, that scares the pants off me. Right? we got to live courageously. Yeah. Your governor, I guess my governor too, he just extended the curf curfew three more weeks. So we're now under a curfew. I, I told uh, my wife I felt like a rebel last night. Uh, after men's Bible study, I, I didn't get home until like 10, 15. And I was like looking behind, make sure I didn't get, no, I was just kidding. I felt like a rebel even last night. That was after 10 o'clock. You're not supposed to be out. And uh, you don't know what's going to happen. Pastor Al said he went out and his garbage can about midnight. He said, I'm going to take a picture and say, look at me, I'm rebelling. Um, isn't it crazy? I mean, it's nonsense. It's going to take courage to live right. Yeah. It's going to take courage. And I praise God. There's some people that are living very courageous right now. And, uh, and I praise God for that. And we ought to look to them. We ought to help them. We ought to stand with them. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and praise the Lord for it. But what I'm saying is, I can do it. I can live courageously. Sometimes living courageously is just doing the things that your family doesn't want you doing. That uh, your co-workers are going to mock you for. Yeah. Uh, that your school uh, uh, friends or whatever are going to mock you because you read your Bible at lunchtime or you, you say prayers at lunchtime. I don't even know if churches or, or uh, schools are gathering right now, but you get the point. You know, you, you start pulling out a Bible and praying at lunchtime at the workplace, uh, you'll get some persecution. You'll get some, some, some threats against you. And you need courage to, to stand up and do the right thing. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, we can live courageously. Let me give you number uh, letter C. Through Christ, I can love correctly. I can love correctly. We know that Matthew 22 talks about um, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And, I, thou, and this is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And so, through Christ, I can, uh, I can do it. I can love people correctly. But that person's hard to, to love. It is. It's hard to love your enemies, isn't it? Um. It's hard to kneel down and pray for those who hate this country, isn't it? Yeah. But the Bible commands us to love them. And to pray for them. And I don't believe that's praying for their annihilation, by the way. That's right. Praying for their salvation. You know, David would have much rather had the people get right with God, even though in his, in his prayers oftentimes he reflected what God's justice was going to bring. But if somebody doesn't want to get right with God, they're going to experience God's justice. But you can love them. You can love your neighbor as you love yourself. You can love yourself the proper way. Mm -hmm. You can love yourself. God says you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, guess what? If you hate yourself, you're probably going to hate your neighbor. I mean, that goes hand in hand. It's like when the, the Bible talks about husbands love your wives, and Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And it talks about how, how we nourish our body. We love our bodies so much. We're supposed to treat our wives the way we treat our own bodies, which is dignified and, 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 and with caution and, and with, with love and, and those things. It's the same principle. So we can love correctly. We can love the brethren correctly. We can love... Uh, our neighbors correctly. You can love God correctly. You can, you can love your enemies correctly. 1 John 3 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God. That is, uh, Jesus, the Lord gave himself uh, a, a, a ransom. Uh, so also we're going to do that for the brethren as well. I know I butchered that verse, but you get the point. Is 
uh, that he, he's going to lay down his life. He laid his life down for the brethren, so, so we ought to as well. We're going to learn how to love correctly. We'll, we'll learn that when, when we, have a church, uh, we have families in our church or individuals in our church that have financial needs, we're going to give to that. We're going to help take care of that. And why? Because that's what a church family does. Uh, we, we help one another. And if it means we have to give sacrificially so others uh, are able to have their needs met, that's what a church does. And if it doesn't, the Bible says if we see our brother have a need and we don't meet it, we say, hey, go warm yourself. Hope you find some food. How's that the love of God, John says? It's not the love of God. So we, we learn through Christ how to love correctly, love the right things. Uh, the psalmist wrote Psalm 119. Um, talks about thy word. Uh, I love loveth thy word. You learn how to love the word of God. You learn how to love the will of God for your life. So we learn how to love correctly. Let me give you the letter D. Uh, through Christ, I can lend charitably. Charitably, I can lend charitably. Everything that we give to the Lord's work, it goes on an account for us to reap back the blessings when we get to heaven. Um, so we give lending to the Lord. He's given to us, and we give back to the Lord. And the Bible says we ought to do that charitably. We ought to do that bountifully. We ought to do it purposefully. We ought to do it cheerfully. And so we can do it. I can lend charitably. I can lend, uh, uh, I think, a Hannah. Hannah, who, who prayed for a, a, a child, a son. And she said, I will, I will bring them back to the Lord. I will lend them. She dropped them off with Eli and said, I am lending them to the Lord. That's the greatest thing you can ever do with your kids. Lend them to the Lord. Give them to the Lord. Um, we can lend to grant to another for a temporary use. Um, the church is uh, Macedonian and Achaia understood that. If you look at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians shows us, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is really 8 and 9. If you didn't know this, chapters 8 and 9 are the two New Testament passages that teach us about New Testament giving. Um, and we'll only look at the first few verses here, but 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit or to know of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desired Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. And again, that famous verse, where you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he were rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty he might be rich. You can lend charitably, give abundantly. Not just what you can give, but beyond your power. Uh, that's trusting the Lord to do that. So lend charitably. Uh, letter E, uh, through Christ I can listen conscientiously. I can listen conscientiously. The word conscientiously means according to the directions of the conscience with a strict regard to right and wrong. I can listen. I should be able to identify as I mature in my faith and with my walk with God. I should be able to identify what's good and what's evil. I should be able to identify what's righteous and unrighteous. I don't have to determine that myself, by the way. God's already determined it. He's already put the standard of what is good and what is evil. He's already put the standard of what's righteous and unrighteous. And we either involve ourselves righteous, we choose righteous, or we choose unrighteous. But the, the, the definition never changes. You know, God, uh, part of the reason that God put his people in captivity or allowed them to go into captivity for discipline and chastening was the fact that the priests, 
the people could not tell the difference between the clean and the unclean anymore. From the holy to the unholy. And they were the ones who were leading the people in, in, in their worship. They were teaching people about God. They were leading them how to live for God. And they lost the ability to do that. And so everybody else just followed suit because, well, the priests are showing us and they're right with God or they're close to God. So we're just going to follow them. And God judged them. And he always started at the temple. He always started with the priests and judged them first. Because the people got affected by them too. But, and Peter says the same thing. He says judgment starts at the house of God. And so um, we have to be able to listen, Katya. You can listen conscientiously and be able to discern, you know what, that's not right. No, that's against God's word. I fear that we know so little about the Bible yeah. that yeah. we hear somebody say something and we think, oh man, that might, that's something scriptural. I wish I could think of some 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 common phrases right now uh, that, uh, that that people use. They're not biblical phrases. Cleanliness, uh, cleanliness is godliness. There you go. Cleanliness is godliness. That's not that's not in the Bible. Uh, that's, not, that's not a biblical verse. Uh, uh, love the sinner, uh, hate the sin. That's not in the Bible. Uh, I don't answer that's not that. in that, that's not in there. So there's other ones I'm sure as well. But but we become so ignorant. Then we, we don't, uh, and, and I'm not using it as a derogatory thing, I'm just saying the word ignorant means without knowledge. We just don't have the knowledge we're supposed to have. Wow. And so we can't identify when somebody says, oh, look at that. that, what a beautiful verse. You know, my wife will show me some things sometimes, and uh, somebody will post something on Facebook, and I'll think to myself, I mean, do they not even realize that's not even the King James Bible? They're, they're posting scripture, it's not even the King James Bible up there. Wow. That's right. And well, the intention of my heart, and who cares about the intention of our hearts? The Word of God divides between the intention and thoughts of our hearts. Right. We're, we're about the Word of God, and it's about God's Word. Uh, His Word, uh, Psalm 119, I almost was going to preach on this tonight, but, but Psalm 119 says, Thy Word is very pure. Amen. Thy Word is settled in heaven. Right. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet, a, a light unto my path. Right. Uh, thy Word is settled in heaven forever. Right. I mean, this is about God's Word. I am excited about next year, next uh, not next week, next week, uh, pray for us. My wife's supposed to have her surgery next Wednesday. Uh, Pastor Dan Novi will be with us. Uh, I may still be here. It depends on when the, the surgery is going to be. So it's supposed to be an outpatient thing, but Pastor Dan Novi. But the week after, we're going to begin a new series on Wednesday nights. And uh, it's simply titled, God Is. That's all it's going to be, God Is. And God's given me 50, ver 50 verses already. For the whole year, we're going to go through on Wednesday night, what God is. Because sometimes we forget, we think it's about us. It's not about us. The church isn't about us. I heard, a pre I heard somebody on the radio say, well, you know, the church is a place for hurting people. I understand what he's saying, but the church is for the Lord. The church is to glorify God. We get healed when we get saved. We're not supposed to be hurting after that. We're not supposed to have offenses and things that cause us to stumble after that. Because we're supposed to be, you know, have a sober mind, a sound mind, go out and serve the Lord. We have to know it's about God's Word. Everything's about God's Word. And, and, and we have to know God's Word and be able to say, you know what? You know, exposing error is not an unloving thing. You know, we, we have half, the, half the people in this country think if you disagree with them, you're an evil person. But if you just expose the truth, it, 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 you, you know, there's certain things. Like, for instance, you know, we talk a lot about abortion. The fact about abortion, no matter what, it always ends with the taking of a life. Yeah. That's not a derogatory. That's not a hurt. That's not it. That's the result of abortion. That's a fact. Now, how you get to that decision, that's between you and the Lord and all of those things. But people will say, oh, that, that's a hurtful fact. Uh, homosexuality is, is wrong, right? We're just saying God's against it. Oh, you hate you homophobe. I'm not homophobic. Yeah. I'm just declaring truth. I'm not trying to be mean or hurtful. I'm just declaring the truth. This is what it is. We know this God made men and God made women. And that's what it is. Yeah. But see, part of the world thinks of that and says, oh, no. no they got to put a phobic on behind you, whatever it is. So just declaring the truth is, is going to hurt people. <laughs> it's going to offend people. Let me, let me say it that way. It's going to offend people. But you ought to know what the truth is. 
You know, you should be able to have a discussion with somebody that maybe you disagree with, but you're able to show them or say to them, no, that's, that's not true. Well, I think a man should be able to choose if he wants to be a woman. No, that's not true. I mean, I don't hate you, whatever, but that's not true. That, that, that's, that, it, biology teaches us that's not even possible. So what I'm saying is we have to, through Christ, we can listen, John Chancellor. We can know. We can, we can hear. We can use, exercise our senses to discern that which is good and evil. Yeah. And then lastly, then we can do this one. Through Christ, I can look confidently for what? For Jesus is coming. I can, I can do it. You know, and, and we ought to do it a whole lot more. Looking under the, for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We can look with firm trust, with strong assurance, without doubt or wavering of opinion. I love Job. Job says this, I know in the latter day my Redeemer standeth and I shall see him. Amen. I, Job said, Job's the oldest book in the Bible that we believe is, is recorded for us. And he said, I know my Redeemer standeth in the last day. I'm going to be there, and I'm going to see him. David often talked about seeing the Lord. We know we're going to see him, and we can confidently do that. We'll, we'll close with this, 2 Peter chapter number 3. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. We'll read these verses, and then we'll be done. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, says this. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, catch that, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Amen. We can look confidently. Jesus is coming. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Thomas says, how shall we know the way? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We can look confidently. If you're saved here tonight, by the way, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You know that you're saved. And God helps you to keep looking heavenward no matter what's going on. So when all those things uh, that come up against you, just keep looking to heaven. What do we look at Sunday night? Set your affections on things above. Seek those things which are above. This year can be a banner year for us as Christians. I don't know what the Lord's going to do. We don't know if we're going to be here to even see the end of the year. Yeah. And we don't think about it. We just assume. we got our plans laid out for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Whatever it may be, 10 years, 5 years. The fact of the matter is the Lord may come tonight. Amen. And that's okay, right? I mean, it's okay to plan. There's nothing wrong with that. One preacher said, you plan as if you're going to live to be 100. You live as if today's your last day. And I, I believe that. But the fact of the matter is we just need to keep our eyes on the Lord. And all these other things will kind of fade away. And uh, we'll certainly have a lot more stability in our life, emotionally and, uh, and spiritually. And so you will physically as well. What can we do for the Lord this year? I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe there's somebody here tonight. So preach, just pray for me. God's deal with me. Bless some things in my, in my heart. Would you pray for me? Is there anyone slip their hand up? Say, pray for me. God bless you. Another one there. Another one. Another one. Appreciate that. I think everybody here is saved, but certainly would want to ask. Would want to go without asking. Is there anyone here tonight who says, I don't know for sure I'm saved. Not sure when I know how to be saved tonight. Would you pray for me? Is there anybody like that tonight that would raise their hand and say, pray for me? Father, we thank you so much for this year that you've given to us, Lord. It's just I can't, uh, the benefits, the blessings that you have bestowed upon us have been really overwhelming in spite of all the obstacles that have been laid before us by man. But we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the individual blessings you have poured upon our people. We thank you for the collective blessings that you have brought upon this church. 
And Lord, you have, you have continued your work here in Lakewood through this church, and we thank you for using us. Lord, you don't have to use us. You want to use us, and we thank you for that. And we pray, Lord, for those that raised their hand tonight and said there's something that you're dealing with them about, about that, and I thank you for that, Lord, that their hearts are tender to, to uh, your touch and, and to your word. Lord, help us to love your word more. Help us, Lord, to desire your word more. Help us, Lord, as we've learned tonight to, to uh, understand confidently that, that we can look to you and we can do all things through Christ who has strengthened us. So, Lord, we thank you and we ask your blessing, Lord, as we leave this place tonight and as we gather, Lord willing, uh, on Sunday, uh, a new year, uh, a new direction, uh, but a same God and a same word and a same spirit and the same faith, and the same church. And Lord, we just want to do great things for you. We want, to, we want to be found faithful. Help us to do that, Lord. And help every one of us to determine in our hearts if there's some that need to recommit, rededicate themselves, Lord, when they do that this day. And Lord, we just pray that you'll bless uh, this day and this evening. Now get us home safely tonight, and we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Uh, two things. One, don't forget if you need envelopes starting next for next uh, week, uh, we'll make sure to max that up with the uh, basic Bible doctrines class. That's it. So God bless you. Happy New Year. And uh, we'll see you next year, I guess. Lord willing. Amen. <laughs>